It's easier to see hope in kids' eyes. It's easier to see them as the next generation and that we lay all of our hopes and dreams on them and say, you're going to carry us into the next decade, into the next century, into the next, into the next. As we go through this slide, I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break this lecture down into two parts. Younger kids, I call it 12 and under, and then older kids, so it'll be 13 and older. It's a good demarcation. I understand it's in the very middle of middle school, typically a 12-year-old's in like seventh grade. But in our group setting, this is, for boys, this is about when puberty starts. And for girls, typically it's already started. Maybe they've already had their period. And they're already engaging in those social changes of recognizing the other sex for what they are, the other sex. So the first half of the slide showed, the first half of the lecture is going to be 12 and under. We'll stop for my demonstration. We'll move over to the table in the middle of the room excuse me, for the demonstration. And then we'll pick up with those teens and older. So, and Dr. Joy, did you post this one too? I will do it just now. I didn't know if you have not, please. I have not changed it. I don't think I have. Let's begin with the cute stuff, right? Everybody loves the little people, right? Okay, so think about some of your favorite quotes about children. My, my son, who's a teen, made me watch Star Wars before we went and saw it at the theater. I'm a Star Trek guy. I really don't care about Star Wars. Uh, so, it was one of those things where I saw Yoda say, this, and I thought, that's so cute. So, but tell me, what are some of your favorite quotes about kids? Well, you could say the darndest things. You can say the darndest things. Don't they, though? Uh, what else? What are some of your favorite quotes about kids? Or it don't have to be like something published out there in the real world. It may be what your mom or grandma said about you. I can say it was when I hated growing up. Oh. And that was children are to be seen and not heard. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, that, that burned my soul. Are you a Baptist preacher's kid, too? Yeah. <laughs> Cuban say it, children speak when Jesus speaks. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. I have no clue. Meaning you don't, you don't talk. You don't talk. Okay. What else? Yes, ma'am. I just love um, it odd. Maybe kids have less masks than us adults. Yeah, yeah. It's like the first day when I stood up here and told you the way I'm talking right now is not how I talk at home, not how I talk around my grandparents, not how I talk around my kids. Uh, the accent is not as bad. I know you won't believe that. But it's not as bad right now as it is when I'm back in Georgia. We, we have different masks, and kids probably don't have those, at least not as many. Uh, I saw over there. Yes, ma'am. I'm a boy mom with uh, <laughs> and under. Yes. So Yes, that's pretty much true. That's pretty much that. That was me until I was about fourteen. Yes, and and if you if we're not dirty, we go and find it. We go outside and start digging a hole. I don't know why. I have no clue, but I did. I dug a lot of holes. But anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, one quote I remember hearing on Grey's Anatomy was, um, and it's kind of long. These are the tiny humans. These are children. They believe in magic. They play pretend. There is fairy dust in their IV bags. They hope. And they cross their fingers and they make wishes, and that makes them more resilient than adults. They recover faster, they survive worse, they believe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that speaks to kids' coping mechanisms, even though they're fantasy. I remember being in like second grade and wishing on a star for a bike, and guess what I got for my birthday was a little red bike. And I wore it out, but we, the coping mechanisms, even though they're not real, actually help the fantasy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's look at the little guys. And when I say the, these little guys, I'm thinking about elementary school age, but certainly up maybe sixth grade also. Um, and I really want to get your opinion on working with them. So they're cute, we like them, but when it's three or four of them sitting around us, and, and Johnny's standing in the chair, and Annie refuses to talk and just wants to leave, what are your opinions of working with them? And this is in counseling, obviously, but if you have some experience from teaching a Sunday school class or if there are your nieces and nephews, we want to hear that. What is your opinion of working with them? 
Yes. So I mean the, the system that my psychologist used with the groups that we worked with is uh, he had like a point system. Okay. And they bought into the system like mm -hmm. so fast and so hard. Yes. Um, and I mean the, the ironic thing standing back watching it is like none of them were well behaved enough for the point system never really mattered. Okay. But just that fictional like warning of like, hey, if you don't do this, or hey, if you don't contribute here, mm -hmm. you're not getting your points for the day. Right, right. So powerful with them. Yeah, token economy, right? Yep. The magic of the token economy. I think I saw your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with um, kindergarten and for a year, and they, what I noticed is that they really, really feed off of each other. Ooh. More mm -hmm. than, yes. You know, Yes. Like the attitude or the behavior of one impacts all of them. Yeah. Ask boy mom back there. <laughs> they feed off each other. Let me make this point really quickly. Child therapy is always family therapy. And that's why I asked the next question. And the next question is kind of an ethical question, but it's a, a reasonable question. Can kids make therapeutic change apart from their parents, their family of origin? Is it? Yes, there's an ethical dilemma there, but functionally, psychologically, can they? Yes. So, like, I, I worked in a project community. Mm -hmm. So, what often we saw is if we weren't able to make as quick progress with parents, the kids <coughs> would start making their progress. Right. But you'd almost be fighting the parent mm. um, because yes. they'd counter whatever you just accomplished the moment they went into their, you know, negative behaviors. Right. Yeah, and your story illustrates my point. There's no such thing as pure child therapy. There's always family dynamics because they leave your office and go back to wherever they came from, and that atmosphere continues to have its effect, for good or for ill, on them. I, the ethical end of this is we always have to have parent consent for anything. I didn't show, I don't think I showed this class. I think I showed another class, a video I did where I was counseling a, a 12 year old. But it was real simple. You know, mom. I'm going to use this video for education purposes. Would you consent to let me film him? And I did, and I, I don't think I showed it, but it was me doing some confrontation with a 12-year-old. We're always going to have to get their consent, so that means they know what's going on in counseling, right? So whatever progress we make, if they act ignorant about it, either we didn't do our job or they're literally acting ignorant about it, but all kid counseling is family counseling. Secondly, should adolescents be treated apart from their family, so 13 and older, should we pull them out and say it would be better if you didn't have mom sitting here? Yes, ma'am. So I've done some mentorship. So mm -hmm. um, uh, at church and then through Big Brothers Big Sisters, and their parents want them. They, you know, they want them to uh, like confide in me, and they understand mm -hmm. that there's like a bond between me and the child, and right. that, you know, unless it's basically mandatory reporting, like, I mean, that's obvious stuff, like, not, like, you know, they, they, want, <coughs> they want their child to trust me, sure, and have someone to talk to and vent to, but I also think <coughs> that the parent knows me. So this was done uh, for parent, I mean, again, parent said it's okay, right. you know, so. Why do you think that is? Because if that brings up a great point, a larger point. Why would parents ask their kids to confide in us, a relative stranger? I didn't, we didn't hear what she said back here. Oh, she said she's worked in group set, settings where the parent actually wanted the child to confide in us, the professional. And I'm asking, why? Why would a parent want that? Why would they not want the counselor to be a little bit further and the kid be a little more intimate with them? Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe because they feel like the child will disclose, but also maybe under types of divorces or mm -hmm. custody right. type situation, they're wanting something there. Sure. So that's too good. I have an eight year old. Yes. Well, she's a counselor. Okay. And my wife and I decided we want her to be able to confide just in case we're the problem. Oh. Ah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's another one. That's another one. What I always want you to consider, and in this situation, the door I'm knocking on is a cultural door. This is an American thing where we look at professionals and we give them this power, right? We say, you have letters behind your name 
I'm conceding my authority as a parent to you, or, c- or ceding my authority as a parent to you, and that's America. At least that's an American way. I always want you to consider our culture and what our culture says about health care, which leads me to the last point. Can adolescents make their own health care choices? Because this is a, not just an ethical issue for us, it's a political issue out there. Can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm coming to the screen. I apologize. Yeah, so this is not just an ethical issue for us as professionals. This is a political issue out there. Youth or adolescents making their own health care choices. Today, pull, pull, pull that part of your brain that taps into our ACA code of ethics. Can adolescents make their own health care choices? No, not legally. Not legally. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm seeing like three hands all in one place. Let's start at the right and go left. Yes. Um, I think that yes, they can because when they're adolescents, you're not going to force them to do anything they don't want to do. Mm. Okay. And so when you give them some control within reason right. over those choices, you stand a better chance of them buying into the process. Yes. If the kid buys into the process, does that guarantee the parent will? No. no. And who, at the end of the day, signs that? release because frankly the insurance company's not going to pay us when a 13 year old said I want counseling and if you've never had this experience it will happen a minor will come to you for counseling having not told their parents thank you for that that's that's a real thing we'll go back to our respective states tomorrow and the laws are different they're quite different yes Joel I think uh, one of the issues is really a hot topic is with the gay therapy the transgender issues mm-hmm. Kind of becoming a really uh, serious encroachment. <coughs> right, right, right. It, it is. It is something that we will face. Let me not get. Uh, let me come back to you. Okay. Okay. So um, let's talk specifically about twelve-year-olds and younger. Things to remember: the cognitive, social development level of the child. I mentioned this at the very beginning of the lecture. They're more concrete because they're in a concrete operational stage. The little guys are, and they're not going to advance just because they sit under us. They're gonna move at their own pace through these development, Piaget, these developmental stages to meet their needs. So when we sit with these guys using the more concrete stuff, what I'll demonstrate in a little bit, is gonna be more effective. They're used to it and they're expecting it. It's almost like the parent who comes to us and asks for advice. These kids literally are looking for, you know, that piece of thing, that nugget that fixes their problems. So obviously a, tor- a, a shorter attention span, lots more instruction, lots more structure, directions. Manualized treatment works great with kids. I have a therapist in my office that that's her thing. She loves using manualized treatment with the little guys and I let her do the elementary and middle school groups and it, it's almost like school, which please, is a risk. Please manualized. manualized, oh I wish I had brought a book in. A manualized treatment is basically you buy online a workbook or how to do that CBT or that DBT or that whatever play therapy, that technique. And there's worksheets and you'll pull those out and photocopy them and have the kids do those. There's all kinds of things in manualized treatment. And so manualized treatment for some people is a comfort. It's a buffer, right? I just ordered this book off Amazon and I just use it. And da-da, um, it's not usually that clean, that clear cut. But you know, that, that works well with them because they're Again, they've been acculturated. Our society has taught them, you go to school, you open your textbook, and you read chapter three. And so that kind of works. One that's a big concern for me because I work with developmental disabilities is a limited vocabulary. As you can imagine, kids with autism have a very limited vocabulary, but all children have a limited vocabulary. And I shared this earlier, they'll say, I'm sad, and what you're actually seeing on their face is fear or anger or frustration, and you have to stop them and give them new words. Now, when you give them new words, you have to give those new words meaning. (coughs) Maybe at their house, the word joy is never used. Maybe at their house, the word forgiveness is never used. Maybe at their house, the words mercy are never used. Maybe at their house, words are only said at a very high octave. When you give them new words, you have to give that word meaning, i.e., you have to demonstrate. The token economy is a great example. At my own clinic, we use the token economy. We have just tickets, just paper tickets. We go and buy a spool of them. 
and for good behaviors they get a ticket, and then, you know, whatever it is, whether it's with the little guys and they get 20 tickets, they get a piece of candy, or if it's with the older kids and they get time on maybe their device during debriefing with the parents. But the token economy is a vocabulary word we have to define. What are these tickets worth? What are they worth? Well, 20 of them are worth a Jolly Rancher. We give it value. It's almost like money in our pocket, right? It's just paper until we assign it a value. Limited insight. This is what frustrates parents because they really believe that the way they see the world is the way everybody sees the world, including their seven-year-old, including their autistic 12-year-old. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a psychiatrist friend say that kids are great observers but terrible processors. Mm -hmm. So, like, they're always observing things. Oh, mom and dad are in a fight right now or have tension. Right. But they may observe that in, like, maybe they don't love each other or maybe I did something wrong. You know, so, like, which I've seen that with my kids. They're observing everything. They're right. just not processing it um, on that level. Accurately. Yeah. They're not pro processing it accurately. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I teach a parenting class. Yes. And that's one of the biggest things I talk about is your kids are not adults. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you can't expect them to behave like you think they should. Right. You have to remember that they bring yourself back to when you were that age. Right. You know, and try to remember. And it's, yes, they can. it's I mean, they've told me, I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've sat with lots of parents of kids who are autistic and talked about giving the kids a vocabulary and it's like I've never thought about it that way I figured I just said it and they understand it and it's like when you tell him to bring it to you and he doesn't bring it to you that means he doesn't understand what that word means or that phrase means there's no there's no value behind it there's no behavior behind it there's no consequence behind it uh, so yeah that's it for me again this is a huge one I'm constantly working with yeah they don't understand the words coming out of your mouth you might as well be speaking another language Finally, behavior interventions work great um, because of things like ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, uh, we used to call it Behavior Mod, just behavior therapy in general. It works really great with them. It's very concrete. You're checking boxes. They're getting tokens. They're getting rewarded at the end of the session. This whole setup of behavior interventions, not necessarily Skinner's box, but behavior interventions work great with these guys. Consider interventions when you work with these little guys. And manualized treatment is great because it's, you can get behavioral interventions in that manualized treatment. And you just open the book and you go to those pages and you prepare your lesson almost like you're a school teacher. And today we're gonna to talk about this. And it gives you a lot of guidance. It's great. Um, the benefits of group with the little guys, the benefits of group is that self-concept. Now, when I talk about improving that self-concept, I'm talking about what they already have. So we get two or three or four kids come in and they're feeling <coughs> anxious, they're feeling depressed, they're feeling whatever. And their words are, I'm sad, or I'm angry, or I'm bullied, or they can't really connect what they're feeling with words. That self-concept is where we are going. We're helping them see that you're hurting. This is what hurt feels like. And this is the word we use when we're hurting. I am hurting. So yeah, that self-concept, increased social skills. This is a big one for me specifically as working with developmental disabilities. I want them to be able to advocate for themselves. I want them to be able to self-care. A 12-year-old can do a lot. We may not have them do a lot, but a 12-year-old can do a lot. They can probably, I, well my 12-year-old can wash clothes and cook some, some foods and she can clean. So we, we a lot of times look at our kids the cultural thing and say, yeah, you're a child. We shouldn't have to. But the truth is, they will need those. Or they'll go to college and bring all their dirty laundry back home to you. And you're like, why are you coming back? <laughs> You've only been gone a week. Why are you back? Um, decreasing anxiety. I put you guys in a group and I say, hey, we all have the same stuff. And, and we feel relief because somebody understands us. Kids, may, especially kids who are bullied, Kids who have already some type of physical problem or emotional problem feel isolated. You'll see this with later teens, and I'll talk about it in just a minute or in a few minutes. But fourthly, increasing learning abilities. I'm going to teach you, like I'm going to teach you with the Legos, I'm going to teach you how to interact with a small group. 
I'm not going to take a kid with autism and put him in a group of 18. I'm going to take a kid with autism and put him in a group of three. I'm going to teach you how to interact with this person and this person. And I'm going to help you. We call it learning curve. I'm going to help you gain that ability to work here. And then maybe I'll add two more people. And then maybe we'll go over to this place and have this social experience. Types of groups, very, very general. And this is what I really do the most of is social skills. But there's psychoeducational. There's a, and probably psychoeducation is probably the easiest. Uh, and counseling and psychotherapy, which is what we've been doing this week. That's where we have been this week. Social skills, learning how to interact. Let's do a demonstration.